The next question is adding capacity during the peak period. Uh, there's, a, there's a huge backlog of demand all over the system, uh, and it's constrained because we're running on street cars and running on buses. And it's going to take several years to catch up. So is that something you're now pushing for? Well, I've been pushing for it for some time. It's a, it's. I mean, the, the whole business, for example, with expanding the bus fleet is being treated as kind of a, well, we can't do it until 2019 because we haven't got a bus garage. And you know, it's like, oh, gee, if you really make this. And, and part of that is pushing off, you know, the expense is pushing off the problem in the future, which I think is really not going to be what Now, to the TDC's credit, they're now looking at leasing space or temporary storage of buses. But it's still, you know, it's going to take... A lot of this comes from the drop forward era when there were cuts made to the TTC, and it's not the same thing as you, know, you go on an order bus and it shows up tomorrow, you've got to hire up, there's all kinds of things that will happen. So we're digging our way out of the hole of the drop forward. So, much ado about nothing, it sounds Much like. ado about not very much. <laughs> okay, so not nothing, but not Not nothing, much. but not, not as much as it is. It might appear to be because, for example, Josh was talking about uh, you know people's buses will come more often. Blah, blah, blah. Well, the, a lot of the times when people you know say, "Where's my bus?" It's already scheduled to run more than every ten minutes, and this change doesn't touch that. This is more routes that are less frequent being pulled to a minimum ten-minute standard. And no sense of recourse either. I and mean, what well, do you do if it doesn't come in ten minutes? Well, just, throw a fit. Yeah. But, yeah, but I mean, at least it's scheduled to be there every 10 minutes, and it used to be every 15, well, one would hope that it shows up. Do you think that the money should have been put towards maybe increasing those, you know, the number of buses on the during peak times? Where well, the, the problem is you can't do that overnight because you have no buses. Um, the, the, harder, the harder challenge for the city, I mean, we've just gone through the whole business where the TTC's budget outlook for 2016 had a, you know, there's the request from the mayor that all departments shave 2% from efficiencies. Well, this is kind of contrary to the idea that we need to be spending more money on transit. And running existing vehicles that are available outside the rush hour more is a relatively inexpensive change. If you look at the details of that $100 million that's the extra money for transit, for transit this year, a lot of it doesn't actually have to do with one and two, it has to do with some maintenance side of the house. So, um, the hard, ch the hard challenge for council is going to be to say, okay, what happens? What does it take to go back, even just back to the standards that were in place when David Miller was there for rush hour crowding? What if you want to make it even better than that? How many routes, you know, basically, the, the current stats show the buses are packed, and if you ran more buses, they'd be packed immediately because of the backlog of demand. That's, that's the kind of question, and that's talking serious money because it's more vehicles, more operators, more garages, extra maintenance cost. And I'm not sure this council is prepared to address issues like that. Do you think they should have had a guarantee, like maybe perhaps you get your fare back? You know, if you that's that's almost impossible to I, I, I wonder how much goes to say every time, you know, I listen to the traffic forecast in the morning and you know, Go Transit's having an awful lot of late trains these days. I'd love to know how much that's costing. But Go Transit carries a fraction of the ridership of the TTC. So that's why we're not going to see that guarantee. I don't think we're going to see that guarantee. Can I just get your full name and phone again? Steve Monroe. Thank you. Transit. Can you just repeat everything you just said? <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to read my blog when I get along with right my own blog. More briefly than your blog. Is this. How, how, much, how much of a difference is this actually going to make? Um, it will make a difference for people kind of on the edges, the periods when services are not as good, which typically will be evenings, weekends, some routes during the daytime. Uh, very few rush hour. Well, I mean, the point they make is they can't improve any peak services because they have no um, The So so the statement that sort of people you know, who are now waiting for their bus to show up is a bit of a stretch because a lot of the routes where people are waiting for their bus to show up, it's already scheduled to run more often than every 10 minutes. And the problem is that either there aren't enough buses, or the service is badly bunched, or there's short turns, all that sort of thing. Um, so, so it's uh, it's a case that yes, it will help some people, and it will certainly flesh out the network so that there will be you know you'll, this as uh, Josh and Chris were saying, you'll have some of this core network that's there all the time. I mean that was that's, that was the whole that was the whole issue with 
for the cutbacks when Ford and Stints were mining the store was, oh, we don't need this little piece. Oh, we can cut a bus here, we can cut a bus there. And you wind up with this kind of patchwork. It looks sort of like miss, missing teeth. Uh, and if you looked at a route map that showed you know, what routes were operating at a specific time and kind of scrolled through, you know, weekdays and then Saturdays and particularly Sunday evenings, you know, a whole, whole chunk of the network just disappeared. Yeah, if you're trying to plan a trip, you say, well, there's 10 minutes service on this part, but then I get to this other part, oh, geez, I'm gonna have to wait 25 minutes on that yeah. part, and then I get or, back Or off. it's not even there, not which there. is the other, the other part of the trust. So the, uh, you know, this is one more step in putting stuff back, but as I was saying to the others, this is, this is the relatively easy stuff because they've got the buses, yeah, they need more operators and some more operator hours, but it doesn't, doesn't significantly increase maintenance costs because the buses are being maintained anyway. Um, it's, it's the low-hanging fruit. We're going to raise the maintenance costs somewhere because the buses are being driven more. They're driven more, but it's not a lot of bus maintenance is on a schedule every so many days basis. Um, and the percentage increase in the amount of service being operated look, look on a fleet basis is really not that huge. Um, so, but the real challenge is going to be, what do you do about all the routes that are already run ahead of every 10 minutes? People can't get on because they're all crowded. Um, there's issues of uh, headway reliability. Uh, there's the loading standards, which they simply can't afford to put back to the David Miller era loading standards. So is council prepared to address those questions and the implications they have for fleet size, new garages, you know, the whole business with the garage up on Tapska is, is um, they're up on uh, McNichol? McNichol. It was going to be Tapska. Um, the, um, the whole issue with the, with that bus question, that's just to handle buses that will be for some growth in service. And of the buses that are to scheduled to arrive in the next five years or so, about half of them, look at the fleet plan, this whole budget, about half of them simply go to increase the spare ratio because they have too many buses that they're pushing out on the road that really shouldn't stay in the garage. So they want more spares so they have enough vehicles to actually move. Well, fine. The practical reality on the road is that there are no more, there are really no extra buses yeah. on the road. You just have more so, spares. So you just have more spares. Now, I've actually, that's about half of the ones that are planned out over the next five years. But that's the kind of issue facing council. And, you know, will, will council and John Tory have an epiphany? And, you know, suddenly this, we'll pick the most expensive option available and run, you know, David Miller plus service levels all over the system? I don't know. Uh, but that's, those are the hard decisions because, as I say, a lot of this is highly window dressing. Awesome, thank you. One of the, one of the things I'm planning to do on the Dufferin bus, which never runs worse than 10 minutes, well, it will continue to never run worse than 10 minutes, it just won't run any better. Gotcha. Um, so the, so it's, it's another step. I think the real challenge will be for the city and for the mayor's commitment to transit, which he likes to trumpet, um, is that the, kind of the next layer is putting back the peak hour service standards to a, to a less crowded standard, which means more vehicles on the street, that means you're going to buy more vehicles. It's not a question of using the ones you've got more. Which it's easy to do outside the peak. Peak period, you got to buy more vehicles, more operators, more garages. Uh, that stuff costs money. And is the city actually willing to go down that path, or are we still just dealing with kind of the, 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 the easy wins around the edges? Do I have to do that all again? Just no, no, like no, 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 no. I'm just I'm just right, 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 out. right outside your house tonight is uh, is a big meeting. I'll be there. And uh, your thoughts on the fact that uh, this is actually taking place, and there seems to be uh, some meetings and discussions taking place, but we all know that. Uh, we're spinning our wheels at this point. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but well, your thoughts on what's happening. So this is the joint meeting of Downtown Relief Line, Smart Track, and Go RER, which will co concentrate in, in the case of tonight's meeting on Smart Track because it's in it's, it's sort of the North Riverdale area. But the whole uh, at some point, everybody who's busy drawing lines on maps has to start getting getting real about which pieces we need, when we need them, to what extent they conflict with each other. Um, you've got smart. You've got RER is basically a good idea. 
people. I was I was actually checking back. Someone had asked me, you know, how long have you been doing this? And I was looking and I said, back in 2001 or something, the Board of Trade said, hey, let's make more use of the GO Transit rail lines. You know, this is not a new idea. And it might happen barely within two decades of when they called for it. And they weren't the first ones to call for it in 2001. So that's an important point, long, long overdue. And if anything, I wish the province weren't dragging its feet as much because they're basically trying to stretch out, you know, we have no money, you know, we don't want to spend it all at once. It's a big part, you know, the usual big part of life. So that's, that's, that's Go RER. Smart Track largely duplicates Go RER. And it's interesting that in some of the material for tonight's meeting, you're starting to see Smart Track and Go RER spoken of not quite synonymously, but as if they're, you know, the only difference will be the logo on the vehicle. Because a related issue is going to be how many trains you can physically fit on that line. You're going to have a 15 minute headway of smart track trains and a 15 minute headway of OER trains. And now you have a seven and a half. You've got to fit the Union Pearson Express in there somewhere. And, you know, there are, and there's all the Lakeshore service. There's, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of trains you got to fit in there. And I have, a, I have a real suspicion you're going to kind of see a little bit of everything. Then there's, then there's the real problem the city has. That line is, is going to cost money to operate. The projections, there were claims in the background study that was part of uh, John Tory's campaign, quoting like 200,000 riders a day. For the type of trains they're planning to run and the service frequency, it is physically impossible. If every train were full to the roof, you could not get 200,000 passengers a day on that service. So the idea that it's going to pay for itself because you're going to have so much fare revenue is just so much on air. And that's going to be a really hard nut for the city to deal with if we're going to run smart track at TTC fares with free transfer to and from the TTC. With all the discussion about those two things, the DRL kind of gets pushed And the down. DRL gets pushed down. Yeah, I mean, it's and kind of an afterthought at these meetings. It's kind of, and it's ironic. I mean, people have been talking, people have been drawing lines for the DRL. I mean, this, there's umpteen in this maps going back a century. But it's interesting when you look at the stuff city planning has done, they're sort of saying, you know, well, it probably should go up Pate because it makes it easier to extend it north into Thorncliffe Park. And the best place to go across through downtown is probably Wellington Street because it lines up nicely for further extension to the west. Well, this is not new. I mean, I've been writing about a Wellington Street alignment for the better part of a decade. The idea has been, you know, and I wasn't the first, again, I wasn't the first one. I'm not trying to pretend I'm the great transit right, expert. Right. So, there's this whole public consultation process that's to rediscover what is already known. Uh, and the real challenge will be to say, okay, how can the DRL fit into the network and not just as a Danforth to University and, and King or University and Wellington line, but as something that goes north, Thorncliffe Park, Fleming Park, Don Mills, and west to Sir Liberty Village and Parkdale. Everybody else is still jumping in. Yeah.